It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. C.S. Lewis, The Weight of Glory, and Other Addresses. Pilgrims, one of the most difficult things about idolatry in the American church today is that our idols aren't carved images in the form of cows or bulls, goats, rams, eagles, phallic symbols, or anything else. In fact, oftentimes they are good things which Christians have turned into ultimate things. Meanwhile, worship of the giver has been replaced with worship of the giver's gifts. As Mike and I bring closure to our series titled Sheology, we felt it was important and necessary to discuss the idea of idolatry. Whether it's a spouse, a career, children, independence, abortion on demand, politics, the Second Amendment, or something else entirely, the reality is that for many Christians, they have willingly settled for the lie which the culture has already embraced, namely, to be devoted to chasing a life filled with temporal pleasures and fading joys. In this episode, we look at three short parables in Matthew 13. In these short stories, Jesus reminds his disciples of the true value of the kingdom of heaven and how a follower of Christ must make a choice. We can either sell everything we have and pick up our cross daily to follow Christ into fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, or we can have everything that the world has to offer at the cost of eternity separated from God. Thanks again for joining us, pilgrims. Enjoy the podcast and stay pugnacious. Three, two, one, zero. which is unwilling to surrender to the demands or the madness of the woke culture. This voice may be small, and yet it holds great power. Power that cannot be weighed on the scales of a godless culture, but power that will nonetheless stand the test of time, because it is the truth. Welcome, pilgrims, to the Pugnacious Pilgrim Podcast. We are glad you are here with us today, and we are hopeful that you will walk away informed, enriched, and equipped to live as pilgrims, in a brave new world. Mike, you're looking good in pink tonight, bro. Thanks. It's actually a uh, solid desert pink. Is it? It so is. Is it manlier when you say it that way? Uh, uh, I mean, I hope so. Yeah. It's uh, it's a St. Boniface shirt chopping yeah. down the tree, and the tree just happens to be a rainbow. So. Right, and, and I mean, there is some symbolism there for sure, because some. Uh, what, what is St. Boniface? I mean, give us the 30,000-foot the view. Well, uh, watch or listen to the King's Hall. Uh, You're but, always promoting other people's podcasts hey, on our podcast. Hey, well, that, hopefully, that's what we're about, right? Hopefully, they'll return the favor at some yeah. point, yep. but uh, Boniface essentially chopped down the, uh, the tree a bunch of pagans were worshiping. Because they thought that if anybody was to do that, they'd get smited. And he was like, your gods are fake. He went and chopped down their tree. Yeah, dude. And they were like, whoa, this man is strong. This man is courageous. This man's brave. And I want to know about your god, right? Yep. So pretty cool stuff. And uh, I suppose the rainbow significance is what? Like he doesn't believe in... Draw your own conclusions. All right. You know? (laughs) <laughs> my, my guess is that he's probably more like a local flood guy as opposed to global flood. Or... Yeah, yeah. 
Well, welcome, Pilgrims, to the podcast. We appreciate it. We're excited to have you here. We're live on the Facebook uh, stream, and so if you're jumping in and joining us tonight, we appreciate it as always. Uh, like we say often, one of the reasons that we go live is so that you can see Mike in a pink shirt. Uh, but the the main reason that we go live is that we desire to interact with you. And and over the last probably three to four podcasts, we've really had the opportunity to do that. Uh, last week was a lot of fun, dude. We actually didn't get to like three fourths of the material that we were hoping to cover uh, or planning to cover because our interaction was wonderful. And uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, it's kind of weird how when two guys sit down and they're like, hey, we're going to talk about biblical womanhood, people just come out of the woodwork and they're yeah. like, actually, no, they're just pressing us. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I think... <laughs> Could it, you it, clarify that? <laughs> That's it good. It made for That's a better good. conversation. I think, yeah. you know, one of the cool things about doing this live is that we can, uh, to the best of our ability, try to clarify anything that we may have said incorrectly or, you know, in a way that was confusing. Uh, but... And it's always just interesting to see, you know, how certain things hit people. And then, you know, it's a true conversation. And so that that's kind of the purpose of really our podcast, of our ministry, of what we attempt to do is that we're, we're trying to build a worldview uh, in in the midst of a culture that that is growing increasingly uh more um volatile towards the bible and towards the god and so um you know uh, towards our god and so i think i, I said the god yeah but that's god. true too that is also a, a true statement i just yeah he is the only yeah. god so so uh, we're going to finish things up. We're wrapping it up tonight. Uh, it's not a direct uh, Sheology episode, although uh, as you and I kind of uh, circled the wagons after last week's podcast, we thought that it would be uh, a faithful thing for us to kind of end with uh, tonight's conversation because we we continued the conversation and it went in a direction that we both felt like hey man you know this would probably be worth uh you know discussing next week and so that's what we're gonna do uh we're, we're, we've titled it we are what we worship and uh yeah uh i'm excited for tonight's conversation We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hey, Michael, I got a question for you, bud. Sure, Jason, what's up? Do you ever get overwhelmed by all the information coming at you from so many different angles? I mean, social media, mainstream media, family gatherings, advertisements, and I'm, I'm just not sure what to believe. Nah, man, that stuff doesn't bother me at all. Seriously? Why not? Because I'm grounded, bro. Grounded? Aren't you like 30 or something? I thought you moved out of your mom's house a long time ago. Dude, not that kind of grounded. I mean, I'm based. Like, my foundation is solid because it's rooted in God's word. What do you mean? Listen, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 7 that when Christians build on a firm foundation of Christ, they can withstand whatever comes their way. So even when life seems to be unraveling all around us, we can rest assured that not only is God in control of all things, but he's also working them out for our good in his glory. Bro, where did you learn all that? Well, first of all, it's in the Bible, so read it. It's definitely worth it. But also, I listen to a cool podcast each week called the Pugnacious Pilgrim Podcast. Each episode is dedicated to taking a look at the world and world events from a Christian point of view. Yeah, but I got kids to feed, man. I, I can't spend all my money on expensive content like that. Best news of all, fam. It's free. Just go to www.pugnaciouspilgrim.com and you'll find it all there. And each week, they stream live on Facebook, so you can join in on the conversation and ask any questions you may have live during the podcast. Check it out. You won't be disappointed. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's a topic I think, I mean, we've we've touched on it, right? Yeah. Like the, the idea of ad idolatry. Um, I don't think that it can be talked about enough though. Right. Because um, I know that I've been guilty in my life of idolatry in a lot of weird ways that yeah. I like while it's happening there's like nothing in my head where i'm like yes this is idolatry and then with the benefit of hindsight i'm like oh my goodness right that was <laughs> yes for sure so we need to be careful and sometimes we need to hear it from other people in order to um in order to really like i i guess compare ourselves to like righteousness 
Amen. And, and I think, you know, really along those same lines in my own life, it's easy to, you know, look at some of these things that, that can kind of move into a, an unhealthy place uh, in our lives uh, and just say, well, they're good things. So how could they be idols? You know, how, how could, how could my kids be an idol? How could my wife be an idol? How could, you know, money be an idol? How could my politics be an idol? And, right. and, and the reality is, uh, you know, whatever garner, you know, garners, is that the right word? I, I don't know why I get so confused on words, like when we're alive, but whatever we give the majority of our time and attention to, uh, if it's not God, uh, there's a strong possibility that it, it has a, an unhealthy and an unholy place in our life, even if it is a good thing. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of the premise of tonight. Uh, we would love uh, for you to you know give us your feedback, uh, and would certainly appreciate any questions uh, that come along the way as well, or comments or criticisms. We're open to that. So, uh, without further hesitation, Mike, maybe you could kind of um, lead us into. Uh, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, but I mean, y you kind of came up with some of this. Uh, thought process last week so I mean. yeah um well i believe how we came up to this conversation is i was talking about an old friend of mine um that has since passed away but uh one of the pieces of advice i guess that he gave to me which is one that he like you know shared he so he has two daughters that are or had they're still around obviously he has right. since passed but um you know it was basically like in a like a woman's fleshly state she wants to be worshiped and in a man's fleshly state he wants to be um like the knight in shining armor right so what you end up having is really just a kind of a a flipping of the uh the fall where you know the serpent tempted eve and said like you can be like god and then Adam was, you know, well, Adam didn't really do his job, right? But um, I, I just thought that there was probably something there that we could that we could talk about yeah. as far as idolatry, because I feel like a lot of men treat women as their idols, right? And then that turns around, and then the woman is now relishing and being the idol, and uh, it can certainly happen the other way around too, where uh, where they idolize the man as the knight in shining armor so right. yeah and i you know i've i've seen it play out in my, in my own life i i think some of the advice when i was uh you know when Anna and i were about ready to get married you know i was in the navy and you know tongue-in-cheek a lot of the sailors that were married you know they're like i'm gonna give you the best advice uh, about being a husband and it's it's this do you want to be happy or you do want to be uh do you want to be right do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? And, you know, they were really talking about, you know, that it, you couldn't have both. You couldn't be happy and right. You had to sacrifice, uh, you know, winning arguments uh, for the sake of, you know, being happy. And, you know, that kind of logic uh, is kind of like the easy way out, right? It's it's not the hard work. Yeah. And, and I think it, it kind of puts things in a, what is it, happy wife, happy life kind of, you know, like these pithy statements that we so often uh, make, they actually build like a, a foundation that's pretty weak, you know, in, in yeah. a marriage. And it, it, to your point, I think it, it it sets us up for failure, but it also sets us up for, for idolatry in a sense that... yeah. In a sense that what? Well, in a sense that, <laughs> you know, essentially as long as my wife's happy, then all is good, all is well. Yeah. And I mean, we do want our wives to be happy. Yeah. I mean, I'm not married right now, but if I had a wife, I would certainly want her to be happy. But what gives fullness of joy? Right. Jesus. It's, right. right. It's <laughs> Jesus. It's not, yeah. it's not like, I don't know, it's usually not what we want Yeah. in our flesh, right? Which is yeah. like a lot of the times... Um, spouses want the upper hand yeah i, I you know? think innate to our sin nature right is is that right we we oftentimes put ourselves in the center of of the world you know what i mean like yeah we idolize ourselves right 
And so I think a lot of idolatry, in a sense, is really rooted in uh, a self-focus. It's really rooted in self-centeredness and, you know, it's rooted in self. And so, um, you know, the pictures that we have, you know, on our episode slide are money or guns or my body, my choice or women or men. I, I think that might even be Eric Kahn. Uh, it could be <laughs> yeah, politics. with the beard and the sunglasses. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, essentially, those are a lot of those things are good things, right? But they can't be. Primary. Yeah, it can be. They can't be primary. Right. So let's discuss. Uh, we want to we want to have. Uh, yeah, I just have to apologize really quick because I got up at like four in the morning today to go fishing <laughs> and uh, had a weird time and haven't been able to take a nap or any anything like that. So I'm like. I'm running on fumes yeah, and I fire. ate a lot. Yeah. Cheeseburgers, so, man. When I was like trying to do the, like, you put me on the spot, you're like, could you? And I'm like, I remember that Mark told me this one time and yeah. we had a conversation last week that we went late and uh, I'm pretty sure we came to this conclusion. <laughs> I mean, do you need to get anything off your shoulders as far as this morning? I mean, I don't want to, you know, uh, do we need um, a moment? Do we need to take a moment or are you? No, okay. you know, uh, I, I posted a video on my Snapchat that basically said, um, you just got to be happy to be out on the water. You know, it's yeah. like the lies we tell ourselves, uh, you know, boat motor wouldn't start, couldn't catch any fish. I caught one really, really tiny fish, but at least I got out on the water, right? Yeah. I got rained on a lot, yeah. a lot. We, we got the first rain in, in like weeks. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, man, at least I was out on the water. Right. Right. At least I woke up super early to go get rained on. Right, it's an on the attitude, I was on the water though. An, yeah, on the water <laughs> in a boat that wouldn't start. But yeah, you know, yeah. it's an attitude of gratitude, Mike, that, that That's really right. pulled you through. Yeah, and hey, I would do it again. Hopefully not like that, but like <laughs> I, I will launch the boat again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well that's good. Don't give up. Uh so I guess you know, maybe to, to I'm sorry. That, that's that's terrible. I mean, that's horrible. I'm sorry. Just make sure to keep me awake, man. Like, yeah. throw me some like curveballs. You know what I'm saying? Cool. Well, let's do that. Yeah, I, I like it. Uh, so essentially, why don't you help us understand, Mike, why you hate uh, women? Uh, <laughs> well, let's get into my story. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't hate women. No. Um, I will say though, like, uh, full disclosure, because of the things that I've been through, like, I am weary of them. Um, just because they work differently than I do. And yeah. I feel like I've noticed patterns in them. Just like a lot of women will walk around and say, I hate all men. Like all men suck. It's like, yeah, all men, a lot of men do exhibit certain traits that are inherently masculine that women really like don't naturally like. And I think that same goes men for women. Yeah. But unfortunately, we live in a culture where men can't say things like... Um, I don't like it when women are passive aggressive and manipulative because that's sexist. But then women can say, I don't like that men are, you know, boorish and uh, like blunt. Yeah. You know, and or, you know, we've got this uh, society where we can, uh, you know, we can treat men like, oh, you never remember anything. You never remember to do anything. Like you sent me that Babylon B um, article of this woman who is like making all these nasty like comics basically just painting her husband husband, like a a golden retriever in the household while she does everything. And uh, people called her out. They were like, your husband sounds like a very sweet man that works really hard. And (laughs) and she she even gave him credit for it. But, you know, she just had this innate thing inside of herself that said it's not good enough. Right. My right. It's not good enough. And and really, a lot of what she was getting at is, you know, her husband, you know, she says, hey, I'm going to go to the shower. Would you watch, you know, would you watch the kids for a while? And the husband's like, sure. And then he leaves and goes to the other room and doesn't take the kids with him. And she's like, well, you know, how come he gets the privilege of not having to take the kids with them and worry about every single thing that they're doing? And and in reality, it's not that that she has to take those things upon herself. It's that she chooses to and then gets yeah. upset with him that he doesn't do that that as well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not going to say that that's like an inherently feminine thing or yeah. like that that's just something that women inherently do. It does certainly seem from my perspective that that happens more often with women than it does with men. That's my experience. You can freak out at me if you want to, because that's a very uh, womanly thing. No, I'm just... 
no, but, <laughs> just, I, no, I will say, oh, so man. I've, I've been in conversations before where like, just, just to get a rise out of people, I'll be like, especially talking to women, I'll say something like, I don't think women belong in management. And then they'll be like, really? Are you kidding me? I can't believe that you would say that. Why would you say that? And I'd say, well, because I think that they get too emotional. And then they'll freak out and I'll be like, you've proved my yeah, point. Thank, <laughs> thank you for proving my point. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, I don't know, it's kind of a mean thing to do because it sets them up for failure. But Right. And, and I mean, if you want to check this out, it's it's from Not The Bee. So it's not Babylon Bee. Uh, Babylon Bee does a lot of satire. This was not satire. I wish it was. Yeah. But this is a, a gal that, that goes by the Twitter moniker uh, momlife underscore comics. And it's uh, the comic that she wrote is Five Lies That the Patriarchy Tells about our male partners and she's got a sweatshirt that she's wearing called default parent and uh you know yeah the, what the, i mean basically she's painted herself as if you know she has to carry the quote-unquote burden of of raising her kids when her husband just to, gets to be an individual and uh you know it, it's a lot of complaining you know like a picture of her husband working out at home uh, and he's all by himself. But if mom tries to work out at home, the kids are hanging all over. Her. And and part of me is like, well, first of all, if you ask your husband to watch the kids so you can work out by yourself, I'm. It sounds to me as she's described her husband, he would gladly say yes. And can I rub your feet as well? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but her complaint is, well, the kids are all over me. Well, right. that's that's a blessing, dude. Like I, I mean, I understand that everybody needs some personal space but if your children want to be by you that is not a burden if right. your children love you enough to want to be in your life like that is a blessing and i think that that's a, a, a lot of maybe what we want to kind of unpack is you know the idolatry that i see in there is that she sees something she's envious of something her husband has without counting the the actual god-given blessings that she has in motherhood and somehow we've raised this this false idea uh to the place that the real thing is supposed to be and th it's a false god yeah yeah and so is the idea of this well i mean just to tag on like the idea of this whole like default parent thing right or that it's harder to be a woman than it is to be a man or that it's harder to be a man than it is to be a woman you know like any of this stuff right like we we need to be uniquely aware of our circumstances yeah. and how we can better walk with the Lord yes. and honor God and honor our partners and all of our relationships for that matter of fact. Yeah. Um, but right now we have this like weird culture of, um, yeah, of comparison. I mean, I personally know like stay at home, stay at home moms that, um, you know, they, they think that their husbands are almost like deadbeats because they like go and work and then they come home and don't want to, you know, don't want to do anything. But it's like from my experience, right, having been married to somebody who stayed at home, having to go out and work eight to nine hours a day and come home and the dishes aren't done, the laundry's not done, the house isn't clean, you know, the lawn needs to be mowed things that are broken need to be fixed. So I'm I'm the one working and I have to be the one that cleans everything and cooks everything and so like what is going on here? And it was it was really all just kind of like this entitled mentality that yeah. I see going around of like, you know, people want to be like a trophy spouse. Yeah. And that's not realistic ever. Well, and not just that, but it's like, you know, the whole concept of trophy spouse, I guess again puts self in the center of some kind of strange universe. And I think, you know, one thing that, especially as Christians, that we should fully recognize is that we die to self, right? Like Jesus literally said, if you want to follow me, you need to pick up your cross daily and, and come, you know, like uh, understanding that that faith and, uh, you know, submission to Christ and God's word is going to come with uh, a certain type of yoke right but yeah. jesus also promised that that yoke would be easy and that the burden would be light and and we have to acknowledge uh what that actually looks like and and it looks like us dying to self every day 
uh, and then saying, uh, whom have I in heaven and earth but you, right? And, and understanding that the joy isn't in being relieved of all earthly burdens. The joy is being granted the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God to get through those circumstances uh, and still have peace and hope and joy and self-control and love, you know, and all and gentleness, right? Uh, the joy is in God. Uh, transforming us more and more into the image of his son. Uh, but, but I feel like we've, we've bought into this lie of our culture that the joy is the relief of a lot of the things that God actually places in our lives to help us become more like Christ. And yeah. so then you literally have people laying down what is best for them and picking up the things that are actual burdens and slavery in their life, and it sucks. Yeah, and they're not happy. No. I mean, they think that they're happy, yeah. right? They flash happiness on social media. Right, and this gal is obviously not happy, right? I mean, she's right. writing a comic talking about how yeah. unhappy she is. Well, and then she'll, like, throw a disclaimer on there, like, just know my husband's a great guy and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you can throw the disclaimer <laughs> all, up there all you want. Like, you're, post like, you're flaming you, him on the internet, right. you know and, what I mean? And you literally have a, a comic book you know, dedicated to showing how unfair your life actually yeah. is. Her disclaimer, I'm going to read it because, dude, I mean, to me, this is, I thought it was a joke because she said, before I go any further into my own experience with this frustrating subject, I should say that this post is not a critique of Ben at all, Ben being her husband. Ben is an amazing father and husband. He carries quite a mental load himself and does a lot around our house. He cooks all of our dinners. He does almost all of the grocery shopping. He pays all our bills and maintains our yard. He does his own laundry. Three nights a week, he comes home from work and immediately handles all evening uh, all evening Charlie May duties while I head out to teach yoga. I mean, like this is a this is a this is a trophy husband, you yeah. know what I mean? And she's yeah. like to your point, like she's flaming him uh in this in this comic book. Yeah, it's I like, don't I don't think it's ever appropriate to publicly complain about your spouse. Yeah, I mean I I don't like it uh either because again, it's not respectful, it's not love. And yeah. and even if you have semblances of truth in that, like what are you hoping to gain from that, right? Sympathy. That's it. Yeah. It's like it's basically you all go, put out there, yeah, to get a you go girl. And I know I've said it here before and I know that we've gotten responses on it, but the whole you go girl mentality is not healthy. Right. It's not healthy because it's like it's pretty much blind to like yeah. what is actually being encouraged. Yeah. It's just you do you girl. Right. You go girl. Be a queen. Yeah, slay, you know, like stuff like that. Like, I mean, I could I could get pretty specific. Yeah. I'm not going to get pretty specific, but um, well, I mean, a lot they of encourage, women's... yeah, they encourage behaviors, especially online that like should not be encouraged, especially within the church. Right. And and I think did we, we did a, what was it like the contend for the faith? I don't remember. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, some of this uh, Facebook type theology you know and i don't remember exactly what it was and we'll try and maybe we'll try and you know yeah like post. the motivational quotes and like all that yeah, stuff just like you know the yeah it's you like know, girl comb your hair or you know like all the right. stuff where it's like you know you're like you know the the ultimate virtue is kindness yeah. and if you're not kind then you don't love and it, you don't love jesus and it's like well, well, and how can sure. you love jesus or anyone else if you don't first love yourself you know and oh so yeah all, that. all of this type of you know, it's really unbiblical uh, messages that, that are being presented everywhere, right, is is what's framing people's minds. And I think for you and I specifically, we, we understand the significance that social media plays in our lives, right? And so we that's why we titled this, We Are What We Worship and We Are What We Consume, right? And so the things that are filling our minds, if we're not taking the time to take those thoughts captive, uh, really, they, they will begin to uh, be the framework and foundation of our faith. They will be the framework and foundation of, you know, the very things that we are striving to be. Right. And so th that's kind of what we want to unpack and and it's not just women right like let's be clear this this is the end of she this is about idolatry yes. we're yeah we're wrapping a bow on
and the whole thing. Right. You know, we're not here specifically to talk about biblical right. womanhood anymore, yeah. although we still could. Yeah. I mean, because women engage in different kinds of idolatry by and large yes. than men do. So yeah. we'll just wrap it all up. Yeah. So we <laughs> like we want to spend 45 minutes talking about women. And if we have time, we'll spend uh, the next uh, five minutes talking about well, men. But to be fair, what episode is this? Uh, for us? Yeah. What is this, 73, I think? Okay, so we have 70 episodes specifically addressing men pretty yeah, much. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. You know, so we've got three for women. Yeah. You know, but uh, the thing is, if anybody ever just like jumps in and they want to see how we feel about biblical womanhood, they'll be like, oh, these guys spend so much time talking about it. They did three episodes in a row. Watch the other ones yeah, where please. we where we essentially like tear guys apart too. Yep. You know, <laughs> like yeah. we want to see people put away their old selves and put on their new selves in Christ. Yes. I don't care how you are naturally and neither, you know, Jesus doesn't ask you to come to heaven as the, the person you were born as in sin. Yep. You know, you have to put that to death yep. and take on the new self and be justified, be Amen. sanctified, be yep. changed, yep. you know, live into the righteousness afforded to you. And uh, that that's what we want. So so when we talk smack, I suppose, about like certain behaviors and certain emotions and stuff like that, if you're offended, <laughs> just know that we're offending the part of you that should be dead. Right. And, and, and that, that's, that is a t intentional, right? Yeah. We're, we're not trying to be jerks. I, I can promise you that, uh, men or women, if, if we say things tonight that ruffle your feathers, our point is not to be jerks. Our point is really to short circuit the, the lies that have not only infiltrated our culture, because that's to be expected, right? When, when a godless culture gets to make the rules, the, those rules are going to be godless. The problem is that, that the church uh, on on larger scales than we ever would want to believe has embraced a lot of this stuff. Um, a lot of it just because of osmosis, right? Or whatever you want to call it. Like, it's just like absorbed in, you know, it's not necessarily yeah. being taught from the pulpits, but it's not necessarily being called out from the pulpit either. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and it's the, just like the black lives matter thing, yeah. you know, uh, through, a lack of actually addressing the situation. A lot of churches became like just default supporters. Yeah. Yep. Because that was the only thing being discussed. Yeah. Right? And so we're, we're trying to be that, uh, we're trying to be that still small voice, if you will, uh, without uh, putting too much uh, pride on our own shoulders, because we understand that we are pilgrims on this journey, just like everybody else. And so, uh, we want to look at uh, some parables tonight, Mike, because Jesus, you know, a lot of people, parables, parables, yeah. Uh, some some people put significant emphasis on on Christ's words, which yeah. I think is good, right? I mean, I'm not I'm not opposed yeah. to it. I just I'm opposed to them holding more weight or more authority than anything else. But but when we did Jesus, an episode when, on that, when Jesus speaks, let, let's listen, right? And so. Right. We're going to be spending uh, some time here in Matthew uh, chapter 13 and going to be talking about three parables from uh, that chapter tonight. So uh, do you do you have them? Maybe I do. We'll, we'll take them one at a time and kind of discuss as we go. You want me to do the parable of the hidden treasure? Oh, yeah. All right. So that is going to be Matthew 13, uh, verse 44. And it goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And it's short, it's sweet, but we get the point, right? Uh, the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? How, how would you describe that? Is, is that too much on the spot well, for it's, you? <laughs> it's in its simplest terms, like the kingdom that Jesus is king over. Yes. You know, it is um it is eternity with God. Yes. Yep, eternity with God and and I would also include what Jesus is trying to do right now in the people that he's setting apart for his glory and for their good, right? And so uh, if you are a Christ follower, you are a, a citizen of 
heaven. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And a lot of times we live with this mentality that it's all about what's to come, right? In this life, none of that matters, but in, in eternity, that's when the kingdom of heaven comes. And in reality, some of that's true. Like there, we, we, we live in this time now of, you know, the already, but the not yet. But in the already, uh, there are pieces of that kingdom that, that ought to be on display, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how come we can live as ambassadors. That's how come, you know, we can be the aroma of Christ. And so, uh, you know, really what Jesus is saying here is that the kingdom of heaven will have so much value that it will be like a treasure that is hidden in a field that a man stumbles upon. And then in his joy, in his joy, he goes and sells everything that he has in order that he can buy that field. So how, how does that play uh, as we try to talk about idols and, and talk about more specifically killing those idols to live for Jesus? Yeah. Uh, if we have discovered the treasure, it is not going to be... Um, Actually, let me think about this. I was going to say it's it's not going to be difficult to sell everything that we have, but it is practically difficult yeah. to do that, but it is worth it. Yeah. Right? And that's that's kind of the process of like repentance, right? Is understanding that uh as much as we might in our flesh love our sin, that there is something better and more valuable on the other side. So as far as idolatry goes, um when it has been illuminated to us that we are practicing idolatry, yeah. uh, it is important for us to understand that as comfortable or powerful or um, wise as that Id idolatry might make us feel, it is better and worth it to give that all up in pursuit of Christ. Amen. I, I think that is... That, that is a great word, uh, and, and I agree. And I think also one thing uh, to that point, really, if I could add just a little bit, is that you know when good, faithful Christian brothers or sisters come alongside us and, and show us that mirror of the idol that may be in our lives, you know, we should be able to say, well, compared to the, the value and the worth of Christ and the joy that comes from that, I will gladly lay this down, even if it's right. difficult, right? And and I think that that's the point that, you know, and, and we've talked about this too, right, is that people get stuck on this idea. And I don't know where it comes from, it, it, but it's like, again, like we can go back to Genesis 3 and see how the enemy tempted Adam and Eve. He tried to tempt them with something that they didn't think they had or tempt them with something that they thought God was keeping from them when in reality God had already given them fullness of joy they had that right and and because of the fall we've we've uh, tried to get back to that place and we can't but but here it says and I I don't think we can overstate this that in his joy he goes and sells all that he has yeah. in his joy because as he understands the significance of that treasure, he understands that everything else pales in comparison to it. And I think that in reality, the reason that for a lot of people it's hard to lay down idols is because they don't really know the worth of Christ. And yeah. they don't know the worth of Christ because they're not pursuing him. They don't know the worth and the value of Christ because they're not really spending time trying to get to know him and understand him and dig into his word and truly see how marvelous and wonderful and magnificent he actually is. They they yeah. just settle for this idea of God that, that someone told them about, but it's not their own idea. It's right. not something that they've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Well, and I have to say that even from my perspective, that's a very humbling point because I've spent a lot of time in Scripture. I've spent a lot of time repenting. I've spent a lot of time under the, um, I guess, like discipleship of other, uh, other believers that have uh, been doing it longer than I have that are, that are kind of mentoring me in faith. Um, and 
because of all that, like there are times where I'll trick myself into thinking that like I am pursuing Jesus well, you know what I mean? And I'll get comfortable. And then one thing leads to another and I'm, I'm like not reading scripture as much as I was anymore, you know? And, uh, when it, it, it's, it's easy to see in hindsight. Yeah. Right. Where you can kind of like open your eyes and see the forest through the trees and see that, um, you know, there are certain sins that are really taking a place of idol worship. Yeah. And, oh man. And it's, it's usually hard to get rid of those. Sure. And when it's hard to get rid of those, that is an indicator that I am not doing a good job at pursuing Christ. Yeah, and I, I again, like the, the culture that we live in tries to convince us of all the things that will bring us happiness, right? Yeah. And, and that, you know, I get that. And a right? lot of them will make you feel really, really good yeah. in the moment. Like, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? Like eating that apple, uh, or it wasn't an apple, so I got to be careful because it was a seedless fruit, yeah. right? But eating eating the, the forbidden fruit uh, was was a, a good experience in the moment, right? They saw that the fruit was looked good. They saw that it was good for eating, and so they ate, right? And there was momentary a joy in that. Not joy, but there was momentary pleasure, uh, mm-hmm. but it faded so fast. And I think yeah. that that's, that's the thing that we don't understand, whether it's, you know, sexual sins, which, which is rampant in our culture right here in America. You know, we, we settle for the, the cheap one night stand, tender swipe, you know, whatever the case may be, right? Or even, even sitting on tender and, and getting all the affirmation that comes from that platform, right? To fill our, affirmation banks and our love banks and our, you know, whatever it is. Right. But all of those things are hollow, empty, uh, treasure. They're hollow and they're empty and they cannot provide what they promise to provide. Right. So they can help release endorphins. They, they can do the things in the brain yeah. that set the, the serotonin free. But once that's over, it's gone. It's like a drug. Amen. It, it really, really is. is. And I think that that's all the enemy really has to offer. You know, he, he can't create. So all he does is try to spin things in order to try and manipulate us and cheat us of what God actually has for us. Yeah. Uh, we got a comment from uh, Naomi that says, if you aren't willing to give it all up, you can't be a true disciple. And and I, I would... I would say amen to that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it's it's easier said than done. Absolutely. Uh, but in, in reality, everything pales in comparison to Christ. And, and in some ways, I think that that's really what we struggle with in the land of the plentiful you know, is that we, at our fingertips, we, we are so financially secure and blessed in a lot of ways that, you know, we can watch something on TV today and, and buy it tomorrow. Yeah. You know, we might even be able to click on Amazon link tonight and have it delivered by 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. You know what I mean? So that is as wonderful as those things can be at times. They, the the temptation is is to make those things gods yeah and it's i mean i i'm gonna go ahead and get into this topic just for a second but like (laughs) especially with like sexual sin you know what i mean yeah once upon a time in order to get like you know sexual gratification you would have to develop a relationship get married you know what i mean and then i mean that was how society worked unless you wanted to be a social provider pariah right. and be an outcast yeah. in society and now our culture has come to embrace all of this sexual deviancy so much that it has turned into an act of worship yeah a hundred percent yep and it is also incredibly available i mean for men for women whatever uh whether you're engaging in online activity or uh otherwise right, right? so um yeah it's uh it's especially important to make sure that you are occupying as much time as you can with things that are of the lord because if you are doing that you will likely be protected from that 
idle time that produces idol worship. Amen. Yep. Two different yeah, types no, of idol. A, that's a, yeah, <laughs> but but they're so connected most of the time, right? If if you're devoted to Christ uh, and you're spending your your life and your time to glorify Him, right? You're not going to be, you know, the the servant who took that treasure that Jesus gave, not Jesus, but the Master gave, and then buried it in a field and then did nothing, right? Except waste time. Right. Uh, we're we're going to be, the more you understand Christ, the more you're going to want people in your life to know him. And the more you're going to want to pour your life out for him, uh, for the glory of his name and the good of yourself and everybody in your sphere of influence. Right. right. And I think that that's why you, you see, you know, Christians that, that don't engage in serving others and, and doing some of these things kind of, you know, ho-hum about their faith, where those that are totally sold out and being called the Jesus freaks, they seem to just have this uh, energy that comes from them that, that is unexplainable. Like, how can you keep doing that? Like, don't you get worn out? Well, no, I don't because I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit. And selfishly, you know, even though it's probably not selfish, there is so much joy in the give that why would I stop? You know, why would yeah. I stop? Well, that, I mean, that's the way that God built it for a reason, right? Right. I mean, fullness of joy is something that we are offered as Christians. Yes. I mean, that is a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, so, his presence, yep. yeah, uh, when we are living according to his ways and we are being generous with our time, we're being loving, um, we are, uh, you know, living life as shepherds to those who need shepherding and as sheep to the shepherd, right? Which which means we may have to rebuke our friends, yeah. right? We may yeah. have to receive rebukes. Um, we will receive fullness of joy. Yep. I mean, I'll tell you what, like when I get an opportunity to like help, <laughs> I, you can ask my parents. I was not that way. <laughs> I was not that way as a child. I was not that way as a non-believer. But now that the Holy Spirit resides within me, it's something I'm like grateful to have an opportunity to do is to like help the people I love. And that, that, that to me is like pretty unexplainable without the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because nope, that, that's agree. not, it's never been a trait of mine. It's right. not one that I worked hard to develop. Yeah. It's something that the Lord just blessed me with. Yep. So it's not a selfish joy if the way that you receive that joy is through selflessness. Right. Right. I, I agree. Yep. I agree with that. And I think, you know, it's it really is kind of this upside down kingdom that people don't understand because it, 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 unless you're a Christian, you can't really understand. Right. Because it, it, it runs contradictory to what we're being told you know, really in, in America, right? Which is, you know, if you work hard and you pursue happiness that you're going to find it, right? Whereas Christianity mm -hmm. is like, dude, we don't have to pursue happiness. Like happiness came and pursued us. We're And not only yeah. that, but we're not going to settle for happiness, right? We're going we're going for fullness of joy and that can only be found in one place. Oh, yeah. And so we're going to, we'll look at the, the second uh, parable here, which is much like the first. Uh, it's not going to sound too much different, but, but again, I think there's a reason that Jesus is, is saying both of these things uh, really back to back here is mm -hmm. he's trying to make a point. All right. You got it up. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you want me to read it? Yeah. This we're taking the, turns. This is the parable of the pearl of great value. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all he had and bought it. And that's Matthew 13, verse uh, 45. 45. Yeah, 45 and 46. I'm yeah. sorry. So, yeah, again, it's, uh, I mean, it's a lot like the hidden treasure. Yeah. Right. Um. A merchant in search of fine pearls. Sorry, I'm going to read it again. Who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. That does paint an interesting picture because you you understand that this merchant is looking for pearls and among pearls yep. finds one of great value Yep. and sells everything that he has and buys the one pearl of great value which kind of shows you that that one pearl is worth more than all the other pearls yep. and everything that that merchant had. Right. 
So, so how does that relate? Not only to just Christianity, but everything else that's out there that, that sparkles, uh, but isn't quite like the one pearl. They're all phony. Yeah. That's the only way I can say it is they're all fake. Um, or they, I shouldn't say fake. They're not necessarily fugazis, but they're, they're, they, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. a Donnie Brasco reference, which you wouldn't get because you haven't no. seen that fine Johnny, what's his name again? I haven't, Johnny what? John, who's the guy that just like won a bunch of money from his ex-wife? Johnny Depp? Yeah, Johnny Depp, yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, anyway. But, uh, yeah, they're, uh, because, I mean, certain sins do produce pleasure you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's that's why, like, uh, hedonism is such, like, a uh, popular thing, you know? And, like, people just, like, seeking their carnal desires yeah. and, and stuff like that. And those are the small pearls, you know yes. what I mean? Like, yeah. God created sex to, like, feel good, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, it, that's a part it, of it. It is absolutely abused and ignored, and people spend their time picking up the small pearls and ignoring the pearl of great value, right? Right. And the pearl of great value is is right there, but you can't have both at the same time. Exactly, yep. This, I, this man had to sell everything in order yeah. to, to buy the one pearl of great value. Man, that just hit me. That just hit me. You can't have any of the other pearls. Yeah, you can't have both. You can't. And I think, in all honesty, that that's what ends up happening, I think, in the life of, of many Christians, many believers, right? Uh, especially those that, you know, maybe where the seed fell on, on soil that, that wasn't quite, quite ready. And part of the reason is because they were like the rich young ruler, right, who came to Jesus and said, you know, I've done all the things that are necessary. And Jesus said, well, one thing you haven't done, you need to go sell everything that you have and follow me. Yeah. And and he he walked away because he couldn't do that, right? He yeah, so, wanted both. So that means rich people are bad, right? It's not yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it's not it's not about the money, right? right? It's about whatever it is that that is holding you back from being completely sold out to Christ. Uh, Naomi, Naomi weighed in again and said, you know, kind of connected to her her previous comment, it's because we choose not to depend fully on him and therefore he's not everything to us, right? Yeah. Part of what God wants to be is our complete source of life, our complete source of hope our complete source of joy, right? And that's why the promise is that in him we will find fullness of joy. Adam and Eve already had that. They had that in their relationship with him, but in their temptation and, and listening to the lies of the enemy, they they twisted what they already knew to be true about God mm -hmm. and, and, and then fell for the lie. And so I think a lot of times, and I, I've kind of sussed this out myself several times, I don't think the sin of Adam and Eve was to question uh, God. I don't think that that was the sin, right? Because I think asking questions like, you know, is God enough? Is this everything? And is God good? And is he faithful? Like those kind of questions aren't bad. No, they're all over the place the, in, the, the, in the Bible. Right. You know, the, what makes those questions bad is if we answer them with lies they yeah. asked those questions and then answered them with lies. If we ask those questions and and allow God's word to drive us to the real answers, which is always yes, the praise that comes from that is is second to none. It, it's it's the kind of praise that I don't think people actually experience because they they're not willing to ask the questions and then look at the real answers, right? They they say, "Well, is God enough?" Well, he's enough, but but I really love my boyfriend, even though I know we shouldn't be living together, right? And so they want to have God, and then they want to have their backup plan of the boyfriend because the boyfriend brings a little bit of happiness right now, and God will be mm -hmm. bring eternal joy later. Well, you've you've now answered the question with a lie. If God is enough, then you can lay down the idol of your boyfriend and trust that God will either redeem that relationship and and make it something that is praiseworthy or he in himself will be that fullness of joy that you think you're losing by laying down the sin of you know fornication or whatever the case may be right yeah and and so that that's where these things really uh play against each other and to your point you can't you can't have both you can't have sin and god you right. can't 
Yeah, even as hard as we try. Yeah. You know, and that that is essentially what we see in American culture. Well, I I shouldn't just say American, but like Western right. culture is you you see especially in the church, you see people trying to make sin okay. Right. Yeah. By twisting scripture, by introducing context that's not there, by elevating historians over scripture. Right or uh, elevating doctors of philosophy or like whatever, you know. Or even new new understandings of scripture, yeah. new interpretations and cultural context. Yeah, and it, it all falls flat. It all falls apart. Um, it's, it's all exposed uh, in, in due time, right? Yeah. You, if, you, if you let any of this stuff proliferate for long enough, it will all be exposed. Yep, and I would say one other major disservice uh, that the church is doing is not necessarily embracing all this bad theology, but failing to talk about the good theology in fear of ruffling people's feathers and and losing congregants. Right? Uh, yeah. And, and I let them go. Let them go. Not if, only is yeah. that scriptural, right? Like you let them go <laughs> in hopes that they would go and and that they could be restored, right? So that yeah. that is a godly command. But but at the same time, like you have a fear of man, or you have a fear of trusting God fully, right? right. When and and I, I I think far too many churches are just like, well, dude, we're just here to bring the truth, and we sure hope our congregants get it. Well. They're not going to get it if you're not going to be a good shepherd. They're not going to get it if you're not willing to practice the kind of church discipline that we read about in Scripture. Why would they? We should There's, do an episode on church discipline. I, I agree, uh, yeah. and I think we'll we'll ask. I mean, if Tracy doesn't mind filling in for me that that week as well, <laughs> but no, I I think that's a good point, right? Because it's it's a church practice that's lost in a culture that has embraced. Yeah. Uh, uh, a soft theology I, that has no room for correction. Right. I actually just got into a pretty big discussion this last weekend. With, you told me that. Yeah, about about church discipline in yeah. general. So I really actually would like to put in the time to do the research yeah, and, and do an episode cool. on that. Well, why don't we uh, read our last yeah. parable? For sure. Did our feet just touch? Did our, they? Our oh, feet I'm just touched. <sighs> I'm wearing a chop chop shirt <laughs> anyway, <laughs> with, the, we're with the rainbow tree. Yeah, for our listeners and viewers, that's how we're uh, facing each other. We're on the opposite sides yeah. of the same desk. Yeah, so. <laughs> Mike's uh, straddling uh, my legs right now. <laughs> <laughs> not that's, true. That's not true, but not it true. should be. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> this is the, yeah, good lead in here. <laughs> Matthew 13, verses 47 through 50. The parable of the net. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Man, that doesn't sound very uh, inclusive. Yeah. It just, uh, it's oh, a man. Harsh one. It's a harsh verse. Not, yeah. not as, it doesn't play as well as the pearl of greatest price or, you know, the hidden treasure, but it plays real well with understanding that uh, there will be sifting. There, there will be sorting that goes on. And, and we have to understand that we're, we're playing with real life here. I think far too often we, we uh, forget because God is gracious and long suffering that he is a judge and that he will judge and that he will do sorting. And just because we say his name or went to church or raised our hand uh, or prayed a prayer does not mean that we are going to uh, spend eternity with him. And so right. we see Jesus making that distinction. It's not just because you're a fish that you're welcomed into into uh, heaven. Uh, there were unclean fish, and if you know anything about Levitical law, you know the 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 unclean fish were fish without scales and fins. Uh, they were considered bad and unclean, right? Uh, and you could probably you know talk about that more than than me, Mike. But, they were but, considered an abomination, right? And so to that eat. right, and so yeah. that that's the point that's being made here is that there are uh, abominations. There are people that are still children of wrath 
uh, who said, well, hey, I'm a fish. I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a sheep. I'm in the herd. I'm in the flock. I go to church on Sunday. Uh, but that, that's not sufficient. Uh, and so I think as we, as we talk about idolatry, I don't want to just talk about it in, in tangible uh, ways without acknowledging that idolatry is a sin and the wages of sin is death. Uh, and, and so it's not just a bad idea. It's not just something that uh, we shouldn't do because it's not great for us. I mean, right. it's sin. And, and we have to be killing our sin or our sin will be killing us. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. and, and the Bible doesn't mince words about that. In fact, uh, like Jesus said, wh where are they going to go, Mike? To the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ganash? Like, is, Ganashing. That, is that a cake thing? or Gnashing. I, yeah. I, I mean, you know, the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace, furnace right? Yeah. Like, this is real life, folks. This is real life. Yeah, yeah. and Satan's not going to just be some cartoonish red figure with a pitchfork and a tail listening to ACDC. Yeah. You know? Like that, that whole caricature has been, um, actually pretty terrible for people's understanding of who the enemy is and who God is. Um, if you read your Bibles, you'll know that obviously. So just, you know, be careful of like those kinds of depictions and stuff like that, because we don't, we really shouldn't, be playing like silly games like yeah. that with uh with eternity right so. yeah and i i think you know the the call for us in this right and and again we we've connected it to sheology we've talked about why in some ways it's connected to sheology right uh you know the, the my body my choice right that that becomes the mantra and and the cry and and then it becomes the passion and then it becomes the i i refuse to live without this and accept anything that goes against this right yeah. and that's how idols work right they start out as, as these small ideas or things and then they creep into our lives into such a place of prominence that literally they they direct the choices that we make yeah and and i think that that's that's the point that we're trying to make is we are what we worship if we worship God, if we submit to his word, if we allow his word to have authority over our lives, it's going to transform how we think. It's going to transform how we speak. It's going to transform how we give, how we spend our time, how we use our money and the talents and the resources that God has given to us. If we give that kind of place to other things, you know, whatever they are, but they're not God, those things will begin to, to bear that exact same kind of fruit, right? But it's not going to be fruit that leads to godliness. It's going to be spoiled fruit that leads to death and damnation and eternity in hell separated from a good God who is inviting us now to kill our idols and turn to him and repent. And and I I just think... We can't overemphasize that, Mike. I mean, I I would hate for us to have a show where people walk away saying, yeah, there's probably some things I need to get rid of. I'll think about it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want you to think about getting rid of things to have your best life now. I want you to think about <laughs> killing things yeah. so that you can have eternity with Christ and you don't have to be sifted uh, and, and thrown into a fiery furnace with whipping and gnashing of teeth forever. Because at that point, it's appointed for man to, to die once and then face judgment. There's no second chances at this thing. There's second chances in the sense that, that God has given us uh, uh, the ability to repent and turn to him and put our faith and trust in his finished work on the cross and our sins are covered. But if we choose the idol in this life in hopes that God will have mercy on us in the next, that's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. And so to your point earlier, you can't have God and your idol too. You can't. And that's, uh, it's like a terrifying and sobering realization, you know? Because, I mean, as a sinner myself, it's it's still a process, right? And it's just, this whole topic has given me a lot to think about. And, 
you know, I've got a lot, I've got a long way to go. You know, we all do. I'm Amen. sure. But. And, and hallelujah. You know, again, we are, we are a couple of sinners that are, you know, I think I've heard, I heard a, a mentor of mine say it this way. Sinners are beggars showing other beggars where to go and get the bread. Mike and I are not the bread. We're not the source of the bread. We're not the bakers of the bread. We're not the givers of the bread, but we know where you can find it. Mm -hmm. And and so our hope is that we could uh, prick you enough tonight that you would think about the things that are happening in your life, the things that, that you have clung to, the things that, that get the prominence. And, and by prominence, I mean, just go pull up your bank statement and see where your funds go. Where are they going? Uh, pull up your phone and see where where the majority of your time is being spent you know take take your friendships and evaluate who are these people you know and what are they leading me towards and and those things are not necessarily the measuring tool but they are a gauge for trying to understand where are we and mm -hmm. the bible welcomes us uh, it invites us it commands us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because the, re the, the reason is simple. Our hearts are deceitful and wicked above all things. And so we can cling to a lot of things without even knowing it. And, and if we don't take time to evaluate where we actually are, we could be walking towards damnation and not even being aware of it because we decide that we go to church on Sunday and that's good enough. And so, you know, again, we're not here to be uh, judgmental. God's judgmental. We don't have to be, you know, but we are here to bang a gong of glory. We mm -hmm. are here to bang a gong of truth. We are here to say that your culture doesn't give a damn about you. And I don't mean that to be pithy or funny. They don't care. Your culture says to hell with you. Honestly, that's yeah. what they say. They'd be happy because that's where they're going. I, I and don't, they want everybody to go there with them. I, I mean, I don't even think they care enough about reality so that the the reason I say it is not because they're wanting to go have a big party. I think some people say that, but the majority just don't care. They yeah. just don't care. And and advertisers that are pushing the next best thing, you know, all these enticing temptations of the world, whether it's Tinder or whether it's Netflix or whether it's pornography, whatever the case may be, they always promise a little bit of happiness right now because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So be happy now. Mm -hmm. What the Bible is clearly telling us throughout the narrative of Scripture is that now actually matters very, very little. Eternity matters forever and is the utmost important thing for a person to uh, spend their thought process and their time acknowledging, where will I be spending eternity? With the pearl of greatest price, with the treasure, with the kingdom of heaven, with the king, the glorious king who gave his life in order that I might have life and have it abundantly now and forevermore, or separated from him because I chose to settle for mud pies when he was offering me the very best that he off that he offers anyone, which is himself. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> I love when we get to the end of these podcasts and you just go on your monologues. Well I, I feel like you do such a great job at that. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I, I'm passionate because I, I just, I'm so tired of seeing people settle for the lie. And it just makes me sad because I live so much of my life in, in that place. Mm -hmm. And it, God has so much more for us. And so, pilgrims, our invitation always, if you have questions, if you have confusion, if you want to know more about what we're talking about and some of this stuff is just, it's, it's hitting you, but you just don't understand, please reach out to us. We would love to spend time with you. We would love, there's, there's nothing that would bring Mike and I more joy than being able to have that conversation with you in depth to make sure that you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and what Jesus has offered to us and what he has called us to. So that's our offer always. Pray about it, but please don't let fear or something keep you from doing that because it's far too important. Eternity matters far too much mm -hmm. for you to just say, ah, it's not a big deal because it is. Mm -hmm. Mike, give us a shout out, buddy. 
Remember that there's a perishing world out there, so do your part to ensure they're hearing the truth. God bless you, pilgrims. Stay pugnacious. Thank you.